The Floating World and the Legend of the Five Bamboo Fly Rods by Gabe Batson. Chapter 6 Pyramid Over the wide sea, towards distant lands, my ship sets sail. Every moment is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, opportunity, said the man. He was chained to a rock by an iron collar around his neck. How does that go again? asked an explorer sitting on a camel. I'll repeat it, said the chain man. <clears throat> he cleared his throat. Every moment is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He laid flat on his back. How can ye speak as such? You're chained to a rock and it's hot out here, said the on-high explorer. The camel <laughs> snuffed in agreement. The prisoner continued. I can tell by your bearing that you're a well-educated man. So when I say every moment is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, then surely my present state of duress doesn't obscure the meaning of my words. I feel I'm being quite clear. When I happened upon you only a few moments ago, you said that you were left here by thieves. Do you understand you're in a pitiable state? Said the explorer. The chained man propped himself unto one elbow. Ah, yes, the very crux of my argument, he said. One might suppose that if one were in a beautiful palace surrounded by the evening perfume of flowers, then it would be very easy to contemplate with full appreciation the wonders of life. But here, in this vast and empty desert, believe me when I say I am a very fortunate man. <clears throat> Is that so? Said the explorer as he unwrapped his litham, uncovering his nose and mouth. Free me! The prisoner continued, and I shall tell of the curious circumstances that have placed me here. Great things await! Hold fast, said the explorer. I shall find a stone to smote thine chain. Ye shall not perish here. He jumped down from his camel and searched about and wandered somewhat. He began mumbling to himself, rapidly saying one word after another. He took a moment to contemplate a raven crag jutting from the sand. He found a stone large and hard enough to break the chain. He took it to the clasped man. He struck the chain once. How the sparks did fly. That is music to my ears, said the prisoner. Whilst you work, allow me to sing my song. And let's hear if its melody sounds as sweet. Then sing, bird, cried the explorer. For I can't help but wonder how thou became caged in this wasteland. A wasteland it may appear at the moment, but it wasn't always so. For this valley was once a verdant one. A zephyr blew across its tall grasses and beasts wandered its plains. Pray tell, said the explorer, of where you come from and what trouble ye have borne. He struck the ring again. Here beginneth the tale of the chain man. Strange cults are those which rise from the ancient steppe. For when the wandering knave whistles, maidens come hither and dance in the meadow where the viper freely roams. Twas such a fiend who locked me here and left me to die. I could not know his sinister intent, for the deadliest serpent strikes without warning, leaving his victims to fall where they may. I know not how I came to live a life akin to a king's feast, or how I came to run free as the winds across the plains. For I'm not of princely birth. I was born as low as the water on the valley floor. I am from the east near Shishanbana, the six famous tea mountains, whence I jumped from rooftop to rooftop, and my mother and aunties fretted that I should break my neck. I almost did when I fell into the courtyard and played tiles with me. They landed all over the matcha, tea leaves drying in the sun. My mother almost broke my neck. My aunties almost broke my neck. My father would have broken my neck, but he was inside the house at the time. Yes, the flowering of my youth was watered with a brand of daring of which I drank deeply. I am called Fen, and my father saw it fit that I should become a porter. But destiny decreed otherwise. Twas a harsh fate, or so I thought, 
that befell me those years ago as I carried cargo through the first high mountain pass on the way to Lhasa. The bricks of tea I transported were needed by monks, which they exchanged for horses. Tea kept devotees awake during the long hours of meditation, and the horses we brought back were much valued by the armies of the warring states. Tea changed hands many times before it arrived in Lhasa or Kathmandu. Each time it did, whether in Mangai or the Royal Plains, it gained in value. By the time it arrived in Tibet or Nepal, it was a prized commodity. During my third journey, I became detached from my party and so wandered alone. I traveled along the Yangtze and Mekong rivers to the perilous and windy Shola, the so-called Two-Faced Pass. It was narrow and shale slipped from beneath my feet. My knees quaked. A misstep would send me thousands of meters down and I would lose much more than my moucha. To hesitate or to rest on that pass would mean death. But little by little, I made my way. I knew if I made it to the next bend and then the one after, I had a chance at survival. After these harrowing days, I came upon a lost valley. Glaciers long ago had eroded the mountains and plains into the perfect crescent opening to the sky. I found it just in time too, for everything grew black. The clouds hung low and a boron blew. The snow fell hard. It was deep. I struggled. After many snowbound hours, I found an old monk. He was cold and weak, struggling to pull his pack through the snow. I feared he might perish, and so I left most of my cargo behind and assisted the old man. We carried for hours in the heavy snow until we came upon a small shack and were able to open the door. Inside was an old stove. I lit a fire and boiled a pot of tea. The old monk told me his story. Arresting was his visage in the flickering of the fire, his brow knitted from the consternation of the ages. Upon his cheek was a cruel scar left by a scimitar. He spoke unto me. I am Padamabu, a monk of old age, thrice anointed, though I am not a sage. These days I worry grow shorter not long, hence cometh strife so perilous and wrong. My last earthly request, may it be heard. Deliver five rods to the floating world. To the mountains there will go, travelers three, that of a swordsman, a craftsman, and thee. But Padamabu, said I, I am nothing but a meek porter. So it seems, quoth Padamabu. That very moment, for I speak only the truth, the door flew open and in marched a large warrior dressed in color for armor. I am Megadagic, a soldier. I have come from afar. Give me some tea and I shall warm myself by the fire. And so Padamabu spake unto Megadagic. Come, Megadagic, sit by the fire. Ye hath traveled far and no doubt are mired in the concerns of kings and those of men. Strong, Megadagic. I say, rest ye then. For the fates have changed and have cast you here. When the sky grew dark, snow burst in from clear. Prithee sit and rest with swift fun. And me soon begins a long journey for ye three. Thank you, master, quoth Megadagic, as he took a bowl of hot tea. But we three are to journey? There's only two of us. So it seems, quoth Padamabu. Just then, I swear upon this heavy iron necklace, came a pounding upon the door. In walked a man covered in furs and a baldric of chain about his chest. I am Ectamen. I was traveling to Lhasa when this terrible storm came upon me. May I please make my warmth by your fire? Come now, I see some tea. I beg thee, allow me to partake. And so spake Padamabu unto Etkimen. Fair Etkimen, who drifted in like snow. One can hear the whistling winds that blow a coldness that's sneaking through the clabbered. With a banging, a clanging, and a clatter. But the sun shall shine with this coming day. Ye shall hence go forth and so on your way. Tis a frightful task I ask of thee. Five rods to one place for travelers three. 
But, but master, master, we three cried, how are we to complete this task? We are but a humble craftsman, a lost soldier, and a meek porter. So it seems, quoth Patamabu. He opened the pack which I placed in the corner of the room. Inside were five golden tubes. These are the five bamboo rods, he said, jewels of an ancient age. Take them to the floating world, for my days are coming to an end. There sat, wrapped in a chalice, were five golden tubes, glowing in the light of the fire. What can these be? asked Megadagget. <laughs> he chuckled to himself. Are they powerful weapons? He got up and walked towards the rods. Do they burn me hands if I touch their brassy skin? Stop. You know not their power. They must be handled with respect. Made by the ancients, they were the treasures of palaces and prized by kings. They were passed down generations to many great warriors. What do they do? I asked. Patamabu. Tell us their secret. Their secret cannot be told, for it's wrapped in silence. I beg thee, wise monk, may we look at one, said Edkimen. Perhaps we can see what black art is at work here. As if he were a young man again, Patamabu sprung in the air and opened one of the tubes. He pulled the rod out and joined the three parts. He gave it a wiggle. He took his cup and poured some tea, wetting the rod. You'll have to believe me, stranger, because I don't know any other way to tell it. But Patamabu became the walls, and the walls became him. In him we could see the black silhouette of the Crescent Valley outside. His body was like a chasm into which a universe of stars rushed through. He pulled apart the rod and put it back in the tube. All this happened in an instant. The whole rest of the night passed without a single word spoken between us. I get chills recounting it now, even in this desert sun. What is your name? The chain man asked the helpful stranger when he had paused from striking the stone against the chain. I'm called Doruk, and I shall continue my endeavor to release you from your cage, though I'm certain you're a songbird who is about to lay. Ha! <laughs> Would a lark be brooding in this desert? Your swift work has winnowed the lock. Keep striking, Durak. I'll fly free, and you'll see where the truth lay, and where falsehood lies. Durak struck the stone against the chain. Here continued the chain man's tale. We traveled along the high road of the Himalay as the last flurries danced in the morning light. Megadagic sat on a mule, I licked yak butter from my fingers. Edkimen walked with his chin buried in his fur tunic, downy like a chick. We traveled over the six mountain passes and descended into the plain, where we saw men riding fast horses towards us. They said that Prince Akar wished to see us. We rode to a camp where we heard music playing and smelled cooking meat. In a tent laid with rugs and pillows sat a handsome young prince surrounded by beautiful women adorned with beads and furs. We were each given a bowl of butter tea. It's always good to meet friends, said the prince, of old Paramabu of the mountains. That is true, said I. Was a most propitious day when my father found him, the scar on his cheek, said the prince edging his fingernails along his cheekbone. Pour into my ears, why hast Patamabu sent you forth? Patamabu said the mention of his name would bring friends to our aid, said I. Then do not answer. Surely it is something of great importance, and I shall help you along your way. Ye shall want for nothing. A servant brought in an amphora of Persian grape wine. When the lid was lifted, it rolled across the floor, and I chased after it. Do not pick that up, said the prince. <laughs> It, it would be bad luck if we didn't finish this wine tonight. We were given cups, double-eared, with a hollow stem coming up the middle. I saw the Prince Akar and some of his entourage <laughs> insert the tube into a nostril and snuff the wine up. It's an indescribably delightful sensation. Southerners practice this, 
said one of the other guests. Only a temporary amusement, said the prince, waving away the notion. <laughs> <laughs> of that night, I cannot fully recount for such a fool. I was charmed by the heat of the tent, how the silk wraps of fair color floated through the air. I thought I could not stray from my quest. I must not, I thought. Oh, but for that wine, its cloven tongue whispering insanity into my ears, <laughs> mocking me, saying, drink deeply and dance with the babies. May they oil my body by the light of the fire and lay me down to slumber so sweetly into my dreams. My journey can wait another day, said its wicked lies. Oh, the fool, such was I. The next morning I picked my cold clothes off the ground and went outside into the breaking daylight. Etkamen was hunting with the princess men, but wise Megadagic did not err from his path, so sober was his mind. He kept guard of the rods throughout the night outside a tent in front of a fire. I stood over him as he ate a small breakfast with his hands. Horses, dogs, and goats wandered about. Women set about their daily tasks. Children played. Occasionally, a man would gallop into camp, dragging game. You look beautiful, said strong Megadagic. I barely slept, said I. Tell me, what ferments in the hearts of fools who drink too much wine? He drank his steaming tea. He had the habit of turning the bowl after each sip. That day, the prince and I went carousing in a nearby village. We walked through a bazaar, greeting people wherever we went. We sat for lunch in the middle of the market. We were brought yak meat, sampa, and bailiffs, which we ate with barley wine. Tell me, said the prince Akar, are you enjoying all that is brought to you? A better feast cannot be had, I replied. Of course not, smiled the prince. And so our journey continued until we left Prince Akar. I lived a life of decadence that few people can clamber to touch with straining fingertips. At the Indian Ocean, we were preparing to set sail. The prince asked if there was anything more we might desire. I felt that after the hospitality the prince had shown us, I didn't mind telling him of the five rods to which Prince Akar paced about on the beach. Do you think I could see them? He asked with wide eyes. Perhaps I can cast one right here. We took out two rods and cast them on the beach before we three, Megadagic, Etkamen, and I set sail on an Arabian ship. The ship was 18 meters long and constructed of sewn planks. It carried gold, silver, porcelain, and mirrors of West Asia, China, and India. We sailed with the monsoon winds which blew south and west. We couldn't have known what was to befall us in our precious cargo, for no one, save the generous Prince Akar, was aware of the meaning of our journey. We traveled for many days. Crafty Ekkerman's hands were rarely idle, and Megadagic enjoyed playing games. I spent all my time on the deck, taking the opportunity to learn new things about new people. Whenever I looked out to the horizon, I spotted a ship following us. One day, lightning struck straight down to the sea, and a dark mass of clouds rushed to meet us. I stood on the deck facing the storm with sunny skies behind us. The sky rumbled and flashed as a curtain of rain sheared closer. I was hit by a fierce wind which blew my body back. I held fast to the rail and ducked low. Over my shoulders, I could see water and debris cycling in the air as the tender ship was pushed into the storm. The next morning, I came above board and helped with the cleaning and the repairs. The sea was peaceful and birds flew about. As I scrubbed the deck, I looked to the northeast and the other ship was still on the horizon. When we rounded India and headed up the Malabar coast, a small boat crept closer until it sidled to our starboard deck. Men boarded and introductions were made. A few laughs were shared. One by one, more boarded. They stepped over the rail, flashing charming smiles and raised no alarm. 
But the rogues had cloaked swords, knives, and efficient weapons. Before long, we were surrounded and helpless. A tussle broke out. Men spilled over the deck with a shove and a yell from our captain. The strangers picked the captain up and swung him as if they were playing with a baby and brought him down head first. They pressed his face into the planks and forced his hands behind his back. Weapons were revealed and a bloody nightmare ensued. I saw the sinister smiles of men as they lunged with the skeins of guile. I darted to the secreted rods, but after I pulled the sack out from a hole in the galley, I was spotted by one of the beasts and so pursued. I rushed onto the deck and was greeted by the din of cloying death. Furious flames were raging up the mainmast. I tripped over bodies to get to the port side, but some pirates were alerted. Just as I spun to avoid a stabbing dirk, I heard brave Megadaki thrashing and goring to my rescue. I clambered to the transom. I stepped on the rail about to leap with the rods, but I was hit upon the head and fell into the ocean. When I awoke, amid falling ash and bits of burning wood, the golden tubes were bobbing around me in the sea. Our boat was a fiery mirage with brave Megadaki still fighting on the deck. I was never to see him again. (laughs) I hid behind a floating beam, clutching the four rods. Alas, I couldn't find the fifth. I couldn't find the fifth. Pirates scurried off in their small craft. The ship that had been following us came from the horizon to our salvation. I boarded with the help of the benevolent strangers. Ekman was saved too, though we could not utter a word to each other. So broken were our hearts. In Bombay, we navigated the dance of India, pounding bright colors, music, prayer, and the masses of people. We boarded a steamer, head for the Red Sea. We traveled so far and had lost so dearly. We weren't halfway there. Edkimid was worried, but our passage ended up being uneventful, even if we were holed up with a lively and rowdy crowd in steerage. In Suez, we embarked on an overland passage to Alexandria. The first leg was a caravan across to Cairo. It was to be a difficult passage, and for many days, the desert was emptier than the sea and deadlier than the mountains. Sifting sands made our traveling feet heavy as with the snows of the Himalay. But our guides knew the desert as easily as they knew their own tracks across the dunes. Knowledge was life. It was passed down through the generations, just as the muleteers did back home. We were drinking at a well when another caravan approached. Water rights for these way stations were well guarded, rarely granted to outside tribes, and only then, after all night negotiations and tents, pitched in the dunes. As I filled my water skins, I saw a familiar shadow cross over me. I looked up to see the face of my friend Prince Akar. Impossible, I thought. I demanded he tell me who he was, for surely this was a cruel imposter. But it was him. Let me show you something, he said. We walked to a camel upon which was swaddled the fifth rod in its golden tube. How came you to possess it? I asked. How came ye to lose it? Said he. I started to tell him of the pirates in the Arabian Sea. He interrupted me. Fool! He yelled. Do you expect me to weave you a tapestry with a single thread? Can you not see the whole picture? Do you think I chase after you for sport? (laughs) Yea, ye truly are a fool. At first I was prone to let you go, if only for the sake of old Patamabu. But how could he trust such a pitiful creature to be a caretaker for these treasures? It was senility and wretchedness which advised him to do so. The very idea. A meek porter. A common tradesman and a lowly soldier. Nay, these rods are too precious. Fate has decreed that I shall be the caretaker from now on. Great princes commit great sins. 
He motioned to his men. They already had put Etkemen in chains, and I was to join him. We were walking for miles through the sand. Our feet grew blisters, and dry skin turned foul under the irons. I took to taunting the prince. What say ye, snake? I said. Hissing lies. I trusted you. You? Trusted me? His eyes twinkled with delight. The very idea. I was never yours to trust. So charmed and seduced by pouring wine and dancing women. To you, they make the whole world. To me, an easily given pittance. The prince had enough, and thus I was anchored to this rock and left to die. Dura gave Fen a water skin which he tipped back. Water did flow past his lips to cool his parched throat. The round sun sat high in the sky, orange in the sandy haze. His ears were ringing. As I laid here, I contemplated my plight. When I was young and full of daring, any unhappiness came from without, like a rainy day when I wanted to go out and play. But as I grew older, I found my unhappiness came from within. The fruits of passion became my solve for all troubles, though no amount of feasting, wine, or bold and lusty pursuits could ever fully satisfy. As I was dying, I understood it was I who put myself here, not the prince, and if I remained alive, I would cherish every moment as a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Here is ended the tale of the chained man. Fen was free to go. Durok left the broken chain and covered Fen up and put him onto a camel. And so they made their escape. They journeyed throughout the day as the sun began to set. The air grew cold. Egypt is in twilight, said Durok. Fen looked up from his dazed half slumber and saw the stars of the darkening sky between date trees growing around a grassy pool of an oasis. Cloaked in night, they convalesced. Doric was a few paces from Fen, quietly mumbling to himself. Fen called to him. If we hurry to Cairo, I'd wager we'd catch the snake. How does that go again? Surely you understand. If we go to Cairo, we are sure to catch the snake and recover the five rods. You battle the prince and take back the rods, said Durok. His voice rang out, mocking like a schoolboy. What else would you have me do? Asked Fen. I'm kidding. Of course I'll go with you. I cannot wait to crush this pest and feel his shell crumble beneath my sandal. I, he shall rue the day he heard the name Durok. Brave Durok! Fair good friend. Fen clasped him by the arms with tears in his eyes. There'll be knives in Cairo tonight, said Durok the next evening as they entered the city. We shall rendezvous in Giza if we get separated, said Fen. The dust of the day settled in the last call to prayer sang from the towers. Prince Akar and his entourage made their way to a hammam in El Koba. The prince was bathed, oiled, and he feasted in opulence. Supplicants and servants pleased his every wish, but what skulked in the shadows? That much he couldn't be completely sure of, for treachery and misery followed the smell of cooking meat like rats. Fen hid, waiting for opportunity. The prince passed the evening with an uncommon form of aggressive languor. Ah, the spoils of life. He had the five rods displayed proud like trophies as gleaming beacons of conquest. The night grew late and the men's senses were dulled with wine and fatty haunches of roasted lamb. Fen and Durak with drawn dirks passed through the side door and crept along the warm dark passage, reverberating with song and cheer. Fen pushed through the table where the rods lay. They stepped over strewn hanks of silvery silk which fine and light floated as air escaped from underneath their sandals. From behind the table, Durak passed the tubes one by one to Fen, who wrapped them in a lavender sari dropped by a dancer. As they crept away, the men laughed and music played. So merry were they. But one of the women recognized Fen and startled, if only for a moment. But that was enough. 
to raise the alarm. Hey, buddy, what Fen and Durok ran outside oh. in opposite directions. Fen climbed up to the roof and jumped housetop to housetop with the sari containing the rods slung over his shoulder. He got to a ledge and could go no further. He jumped into a narrow alley. Three of the prince's men rushed upon him. Fen swung his blade. The men stood back. Fen leaped onto barrels over tables, kicking them in the path of his pursuers. Durok joined him, and together they ran down the middle of the street, yelling to cause a commotion. Just as they turned the next corner, the Prince Akar stepped into their path. You're like a bird who flies, said the double-crossing Prince Akar. This bird also flips, said Fen, raising one finger. Fen jumped onto a crate and up some stacked barrels. Durok slashed the bare chest of the drunk Prince Akar, who yelled at the sight of the bloody gash. Fen jumped from the barrels, which tumbled asunder. The prince's men chased him, but it was too late. Fen and Durok made their getaway. As the sun rose the next morning, Durok sneaked past the Sphinx buried in the drifting sand. At the Pyramid of Khufu, Fen emerged from the shadows, still clutching the sari with the five rods.